let me begin by kindly thanking Judith Butler for her invitation, as well as Rosie Braidotti, the chair of this session. And I hope she will help both me and you, mostly with some of Andy's comments about digital humanities and calculation. I wish to also thank Athena, Athanasiu, for her talk, the public institution defending what is yet to come, and of course, Andy Parker for his text, The Measure of Digital Humanities, which is a sort of paraphrase of this title of this session. I wanted to write my response because it is faster and more precise and because it would perhaps be more efficient in explaining the context or framework from where you two are posing your questions, that I pose a few questions and prode you to tell us once again something about your intentions. It seems that such an operation or a theater of operations could explain what is a critique or what is the status of critique within a group which has met or which meets from time to time. Uh, this is statut, critique, is mentioned by Derrida when speaking of critique vulgaire and distinctions in Bourdieu. So a group meets, in this case, above all, thanks to Judith Butler, in order to constitute itself as a group, and the word consortium contains the Latin consort, sort is the partner or sharer. Further, it meets in Bologna in order to thematize the critical task of the university with a view, I quote, to support the study of critical theory in the university. From, this is the, from rationale of the conference. In order for any of this to happen, critical engagement, Athena uses this phrase several times, it is important for her text and perhaps these words are synonymous, perhaps there is a redundancy. For example, in Belgrade we created a group for social engagement studies and Adriana and Gazella who founded it are with us, perhaps they can speak about that. That means order in order for the study of critical theory to take place, critical engagement, or even just critique or engagement, must be imminent to this construction of consort, consortium. How does critique happen in a group? Or what follows, what allows for it? Or what is its origin? Where is the critique? This is a question with which Athena does not deal, although there are a number of important questions to which I will return immediately. My answer could be straightforward. At issue is the issue of reflection, issue of reflection upon uh, places before the others or before us. That means sometimes it is a judgment, the critique, or disputation, or neurosis, because uh, uh, upon everything, each one of us individually places before the others or before us at this moment at Anna and Andy. A critique implies that we are part or a group body, and this is universitas, our word. This is Cicero's translating the Greek word katholon, he, uses, he used this word five times, and this universitas is opposed to the individual. That means that we are ever in crisis because we could at any time dissolve, that we are always reforming anew. This is, that's why critique, and constructing ourselves as universitas, and we construct some kind of totality of knowledge or plurality of various protocols of truth. This is, universitas is always necessarily et universum, et totum, et omne. This uh, knowledge, uh, totality of knowledge, or plurality of various protocols of truth is one paraphrase 
uh, in opposition to Karl Jaspers' opening line of his famous book, Die Idee der Universität, from 1946, where he, he said that university has the task, that means that community of researchers and disciples search the truth, the truth in singular. Critique, then, if you want, destroys us, but simultaneously holds us together because this capacity, because what is critique? Critique, capacity, to, capacity to be critical, to critique, to question, to cause crisis, or this protocol is imminent to join work and presence. In several places in his book from last year, this Universel, Balibar mentions critique or discourse critique, or genre d'attitude critique, still tied to les categories de l'universel, l'universalité, l'universalism, and he makes no mention of the university. But we can find, for example, in the last period, several months ago, Jean-Claude Milner, very good definitions that explain what is the universal. Universal is like a road that carries the multiple towards the one by way of the everything, towards the one by way of the everything. When I said that the group meets and examines why it has met and finally formulates a platform and announces a future meeting, for example, Judith mentioned yesterday the meeting in Rijeka next year, in Rijeka in Center for Advanced Studies, then simply by insisting on the words a group or a group of persons, I have placed the accent on what is usually labeled as the humanities. A university or consortium produces certain knowledge or complete knowledge. Example, what is critical theory or what is models of digital humanities or what is quantum, etc. But what is important simultaneously, it sometimes also produces a complete, complete individual. That's why humanities and that's Cicero would say men, complete men or group of people, a kind of new university or new institution or counter institution as imagined by Athena. The production of this kind of individual or plurality of individuals falls with the humanities. That means grammar, poetry, rhetoric, ethics, etc., which are also some of Cicero's protocols. Of course, critique or engagement is an instrument, and instrumentum and institution are synonymous in many texts, that constructs such a complete and well-formed man. Paradoxically, such an ideal man is such if and only if he or she can be a partner or sharer. That's the important. This already disqualifies leadership and inequality. We can easily detect that the ideal or humane researcher is not usually thought of within the boundaries of such categories to be a partner or to produce acts easily expanded by others. It seems that this is the very reason we have trouble constructing a group or a new universities or new universitas or new and alternative humanities on which Athena and Andy insist, along with, of course, Rossi Braidotti. Critique that is insufficient or insufficient or not constructive or false engagement or hy hypocrisy will result in the impossibility to construct the common, the joint, the university or universitas. This is readily explained. We work for ourselves and not for others or for all. It seems much more efficient to me droning on Wendy Brown's text, Neoliberalism and the End of Liberal Democracy, which is over 10 years old now, to begin translate the word neoliberalism used by both Athena when speaking of neoliberalism or neoliberalism as a power of deinstitutionalization and Andy and the connection between neoliberalism and calculation and computation. But be behind this neoliberalism, we can find simply 
ego profitable games that, it, that entirely neglect the common issue while incessantly speaking about it and incessantly putting it forward or advocating it. I do not understand why it is necessary to ever anew use this vague and overreaching word neoliberalism. Hence, and this is the first of my comments or criticism or questions, whichever, perhaps a small invitation to critique, of which we are several and I will list them, I think that it would better to more sharply and to more sharply reconstruct some of our so-called theoretical paragons. Derrida and some of his constructions dominate both talks. In Athena's talk, a paradoxical institutionalist, Jacques Derrida, is mixed with a complete anti-institutionalist that was Michel Foucault. Foucault is perfect example and origin of this, if you like, neoliberal theater, because he is only concerned with his own engagement, similarly Sartre. For him, as opposed to Sartre, who sometimes vacillates, there is no notion of collective work, collective action, or collective change. Could anyone imagine Foucault writing applications, formulating budgets, writing final reports of projects, or even simply asking for money for conferences, for joint work, or for others? Foucault works for himself and uses his perfect political connections throughout the various periods of his life quite well for his own positioning. Further, I am not convinced that his role in particular is important in the construction of the University of Vincennes. In other words, I would hold off from including Foucault in our task ahead. Let me say immediately, Judith knows that I am finishing a book, of, a book of institutions, but I'm not here about all because I I'm here because I lead, because I founded some institutions. I have founded some NGOs as a counter institution, and in that sense, I follow Judith's actions or those rosy, roses and always insist on a group. On the other hand, Derrida wrote applications, or at least wrote one. I am referring to the one regarding the Collège International pour la Philosophie, and he his last published text could be a brief manifest for a new university or for a new consortium or institution. This is the text, Le Modèle Philosophique d'une Contre-Institution, where he gives seven basic characteristics of counter-institution. For example, the counter-institution is not governmental in origin, it does not have war or resistance to any other institution as its mission. Then philosophy, although omnipresent, does not dominate over other disciplines. Then this counter institution is always international. Then it does not confer honorifics or titles, academic or professionals. And always it ensures space for expertise and experimentation, sorry, and finally, we never know what awaits us in counter-institutional space because it holds within itself pre-institutional space, space prior to norm. Uh, I know that, that Andy knows that in that text uh, he mentioned many, many times this term incalculabilité, incalculable. This, if we follow these articles constructed by Derrida, we can see that they are somewhat compatible with the founders of universities, with Humboldt and Schleiermacher. Thus, for example, I quote Schleiermacher, science must be a communal effort, or the state is expected to provide money and not interfere ever, in other words, to, pro to protect academic freedoms. Still, I am not sure that Derrida can offer precise answer we require, we require today, nor that his place in both talks today is always justified. A few days ago, I was reading Du Droit à la Philosophie, and I'm not sure that such writing, the hustle, intense, dithering, the amount of Heidegger, that all of that is quite necessarily any longer. 
Perhaps some of this can be moved out, uh, aside. It seems to me that Derrida's late text, text and seminars are far more significant as potentially new models or new protocols of engaged or committed writing. And, and Andy spotted they very, very well in using one of Derrida's late seminar. Derrida strongly colored Athena's text. The principal phrases or syntagmas is what is yet to come, what is yet to come, or impossibility, pos possible impossibility, or impossible possibilities, many, many games in, in, in several Derrida's text, late Derrida, late Derrida text. But let us imagine that the crucial, crucial place in her text has not been answered the way she answered it with Derrida and Arendt, who are the providers of the answer to Athena's question. This question is here. I quote Athena, our questions are as follows. How do we critically engage the way in which institutions institute? And how can institutions be instituted differently? I would, this is answer, I would argue that the critical performativity of working with or in the institution against the logic of institutionalization involves a twofold move. On the one hand, acting here and now, I quote, as if it were possible, this is Derrida, and the second, and on the other hand, posing again and again the question that Arendt was reported to have once asked. I quote Arendt, what will we lose if we win? My request to Athena would be that she, she take the question that gives shape and forms her brilliant text. There are a number of questions and suggestions in the text to which answers come from various theoretical predecessors and that she answer it herself. The question second, what will we lose if we win? I think actually that Arendt is paraphrasing Jaspers here and was that for that question was answered already indirectly by Jaspers in the Mansion book. This book about the university is important to us of course, as well as Habermas' text that reconstructs it, or indeed Parsons' Platz, 1973 book about the American university, because Jasper several times insists on critique. For example, I quote, Critic, critique is the condition of life for the researcher or for the philosopher. Then self-critique, then substantive, substantive critique. In chapter five, communication, the name communication, Jasper speaks of disputation and discussion. The first implies victory, a break. When there is a victory, then the game is suspended. While on the other side, discussion is something entirely different. Discussion, says Jaspers, has no end. There is no victory. Es gibt keinen Sieg. Everyone who happens to be right thus draws mistrust. Each result is but a step. Jedes Ergebnis ist nur Stufe. The next question or next invitation to answer, for example, much more specific and entirely outside Derrida's empty phrases and fictions, refers to the institution or to the university as an institution in a time that is entirely new. We know that Humboldt sometimes uses Universität and sometimes Anstalt. Anstalt was some kind of synonymous of institution. It is, it is Humboldt who introduces this, I think, fictive dilemma that there is something interior and exterior of one organization. Not only does the university not have the strength to self-institutionalize or counter-institutionalize from within. That was the, which Habermas means when he says that new life, that new life to university can only come from outside, 
extramuros. This is a quote from his text from 84. But it has entirely, I quote Rosie, changed the institutional structure of the contemporary university because of the decline of the national state. The university in that case does not have its interior and exterior because it would appear that the relation between the imaginary idea of the university and the university as an institution has been disturbed. In, this is also paraphrase of Jaspers because according to, to Jaspers, the university is always concerned with the objective spirit. In the chapter six, the named institution of the book in which he speaks about the necessity of the institution, he says, I quote, the university exists only to the extent that it is institutionalized. The idea becomes concrete, concrete in two institutions. Could I offer seeing as we are in Bologna, otherwise I might not be able to, an alternative answer that differs from the first person that protects with which Athena opens her text. This first, she said, I grew up, I had to go not only to, but also, and perhaps more significantly, beyond the university to be able to think and study together with others. Since I think we always has priority that I is only a weak form and is of secondary importance when it comes to, prote to protest, and since I'm institutionalist of the kind Saint-Jus, or in, in English Saint-Just was not revolutionary Saint-Jus, but the institutionalist, sometimes it, it is the same, but claiming that there is nothing outside the institution or that anything outside the institution does not exist, let me ask, does a counter-institutional and global association of students alone have a chance in a critical reform of the university? Does everything rest with the students? Let me remind you, in, 10, in 1088, in Bologna, an association of students is called Universitas. It comprises 5,000 young people. It is an association that struggles, protects their interests, and to which the city authorities offer, give benefits because they demand them. Universitas in Bologna threatens the church and city that it will dissolve into the mere individual destined to perish from this city. This Universitas in Bologna then has nothing to do with one in Paris that would a bit later after Bologna represent an association or collegium of students and professors. Finally, there is the question of corporation that is in one way or another tied to the institution and association and demands a new consideration. A corporation or incorporation is not, I think, by definition anything negative, but one of humanity's greatest inventions. It is necessary reconstruction of one of the main institutes of civil society. I assume you recall Hegel's reading of Adam Smith and his theory from the philosophy of right. Several times, Athena insists and opposes quite strongly on one side the critical self-reflexivity and dissident potential and corporative process on, or on one side, public institutions, and on the other side, corporization and reactionary anti-humanities. The university, however, is a self-managed corporation. This is second sentence in Jasper's book, Eine Corporation mit Selbstverwaltung. The corporation is here certainly more than a mere a technical and juridical notion. A group of people that can maintain its togetherness in one place, like the group of students in Bologna all those centuries ago, or indeed like this group here today, if it wishes to truly exist and last, 
can do nothing other than learn together and produce knowledge. You can find in this, this learn together the word discipline because discipline is a joint learning that produces and generates students. That's why Rosie put the time here. This is discipline. We must respect the time. Well, the group, the group exists very briefly if it is very briefly, if it is causes violence, if its members are partying at the university party of the University of Bologna, or if they have breakfast together. But study, study and research, studium, is at the heart of any collective that is corporation. And the corporation as a name and unity in name and aim protects it through time. Just as this protect Pro, just as this project and consortium protects certainly the money of foundation, of Meon Foundation, or the hospitality of the University or Corporation of Bologna tasks us with the reconstruction of corporate action and responsibility. This is the reason that liberalism or neoliberalism has produced and still produces certain forms of association that continue to be difficult to shift. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for that formidable but also generous uh, response. I think maybe the speakers would like a quick write of reply in order, Athena and then Andy. Um, thank you, Peter, for this perceptive and enabling commentary that you offered us. Um, just very um, scattered thoughts that I would like to offer in response to your generous commentary. Uh, where is critique? I think this is a very important question in terms of uh, especially the inextricability between the topos and the trope of university, the where and the how. Um, questions, and I think, of course, Foucault was the one who has taught us that power is not localizable in institutions, uh, although institutions are saturated and permeated by power relations. So the topos and the, tro the, the trope of the, of the university, um, as a response to your question of where, although I would gesture towards a problematization of the where as such, um, and this is why I try to gesture here towards a more transversal um, uh, perspective and critical situatedness, which goes beyond the exteriority versus interiority uh, modality vis-a-vis -vis the institution. Um, so for me, um, as we're concerned with the critical situatedness of conflicting institutions and uh, the radical epistemologies of post-humanities, it's important to retain and defend, actually, the aporetic uh, gesture which takes us beyond the interiority, exteriority modality, which is debilitating to my mind, at, at least, when we talk about that. Um, second, uh, you talked about capacity to, to critique, and I would prioritize a slightly different formulation um, which instead of capacity, which I find uh, somewhat instrumental, I would go for um, dealing with a challenge to account for the political performativity of critical agency, uh, which for me is important to take place beyond, uh, again, including beyond the metaphysics of beyond beyond the radical exteriority of beyond, right? So beyond and beside, I would rephrase. Um, uh, but in, 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 in a critical situatedness vis-a-vis -vis the standards of privative and self-willed um, individualism. Uh, so for me, the question is how we might think dissent and critique and contestability without reasserting the terms of willful critical subjectivity set by liberal imaginaries and humanist imaginaries, right? I mean, the, the, the sovereign subject who criticizes, um, who has the capacity, 
the rational capacity to criticize. This is something that I would like to, to uh, be critical of. So we're left with a question, um, basically, how might it be possible for subjects who are produced by uh, certain established regimes of subject subjectification to engage, to use your word, to, to engage in acts and arts of, of resistance, um, which for me raises the question of, of the subject um, as a question of subjectivation, um, as, a, as a question of a non-unitary, multi-located uh, subjectivity. Um, and it's connected with um, maybe the Arendtian question of appearance, because you asked where is critique, and I would, if, I, if I am to take this challenge, I would say I would respond immediately in public. Um, I would say, you know, it, it, it takes place when, when people appear in, in, in public, but I think appearance here might be fruitfully linked to the question of the specter, as I try to, to do here. Um, in the sense, for example, of a human whose humanity persists against the forces that seek to expropriate its, its humanness. Uh, and this is, for me, this is what uh, you know, post-humanities are, are doing. Um, and of course, as I said, uh, the public is always already premised upon all kinds of epistemic violences. So that's why, for me, the wager is not to defend <laughs> the public as is. Um, so it's not about defending the existing, because the existing is really uh, saturated by uh, epistemic violence, which determines who is to appear and uh, who is not to appear, um, or what is to appear and what is not to appear. Um, uh, I'm not implying that the critique takes place only in institutions. I try to problematize this in outside modality anyway, but I think it's important to defend, it's important for, for us, whatever this us, with all the trepidations that this us brings with it, um, I think it's important for, okay, let me try to be more specific, to, it's important for uh, what I would describe as a left-wing uh, theoretical anti-humanism, uh, which is interested in defending the humanities, um, in its critical post-human uh, formulation. It's important to be able to defend the possibility um, of these institutions to foster uh, critical agency, the political performativity of critical agency. And it's, it's important for me also to um, keep in mind the dangers and the snares the, the, entice, the, the entices is the word, uh, of uh, both institutionalization and anti-institutionalism at the same time. And I think um, what is important here is to defend the possibility as such, especially if we take into consideration that neoliberal, inst neoliberal institutions, non-instituted, non-elected, non-accountable institutions uh, are into the business of annulling uh, the possibility as such, the, the, the very effective register of the possibility, you know, that the dictum tina, there's no alternative, captures very well um, this, this uh, register. So, we, I mean, we have to um, contest this, this um, there's no possibility, there's no alternative kind of um, modality. And you mentioned Derrida and, and his uh, um, uh, idea of the, of counter, the word contre uh, in, in Derrida um, is a very important word. I'm, I'm having in mind, I'm, I'm sure we have maybe the same text, but basically his text, Counter Signature, which was published in Paragraph, the journal Paragraph, where, where he talks about uh, how uh, the, the, the word, the prefix counter, um, does not merely connote opposition, does not merely connote contrariety contrari and, and contradiction, but also proximity. I think he, he, he mentions near contact, 
near contact. Near contact is a very interesting word, an almost spectral near, con near contact uh, and proximity. So that's, that was, uh, I think my point was exactly that, to, to, um, to mark this counter with both registers of, of um, opposition and, and um, uh, proximity at the same time. And finally, one final um, point maybe, uh, well, yes, uh, the Arendt's formulation, uh, what would we lose if we win, which is, in, I think, in Arendt's uh, context, which was actually uh, a context in which she talked about her own conflicted stance uh, about feminism. And I think her point of departure is rather conservative, uh, if I may put it this way, but uh, I'm interested in reformulating this uh, mysterious uh, formulation, what would we lose if we win? Um, because I think it's a, uh, it's a question which alerts us to the uh, undecidable ambivalence of uh, the object of our commitment, or of our political desire even. And I think it's important that uh, it helps us to guard against institutionalization uh, of our standpoints, especially in the face of victory, whatever that means. Because of course, I mean, again, victory, defeat, these are very fraught uh, concepts which beg for further problematization. Um, but for me, it's important to pose this question, what would we lose if we win, together with the question uh, of acting here and now as if it were possible. So for me, it's not a, a, a kind of, um, it doesn't guard me against action, but quite the contrary, it reposes uh, the necessity to act here and now um, as, as an aperture into uh, the future. And I think this, this aperture, this openness is something that really uh, um, uh, should be defended. I mean, the, we, we should defend this openness against any attempt to foreclose it as such. So that, that's, that's about it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, and also, again, Athena, the uh, I was struck in, in hearing your comments, which I, I found extremely illuminating and helpful, um, especially the Jaspers, which I didn't know about uh, and will want to track down now. Um, um, the question that you raise about, or, or that you and Athena both are raising about what kind of institution the university is, is is the university a model of institutions? Um, is, is very important. Um, and I, I also take it that this is Derrida's question, um, although I, I don't recall him ever posing it exactly that way. Um, do, these, do these terms encompass each other? Do they without remainder? Um, and I. Um, it, it, is a, a, it is a very fruitful question to ask, and I think one would, as we're doing also this weekend, proceed with case-by-case -case basis, because you might find very different answers. I, again, I, I felt um, from Gisela's comments uh, yesterday that the, 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 the case of the Buenos Aires is very different in the imagination of the autonomous possibility than, um, say, uh, exist at this point in the United States or perhaps also in Belgrade. Um, and, and yet there are points in common, the, the, the question of self-governance, self-management, um, that Jaspers, was, Jaspers used the term corporation, self-managing corporation, um, or it may have been was it Humboldt, that, that the, the question of the business model 
um, is there long term is, is fascinating. I, I have a question about uh, if I understood um, the, your point about Foucault working for himself, which is extremely provocative, interesting. Um, and I perhaps can see parts of what you mean by this, but I would need to have some further elaboration. Um, he is not an institution, is not a university institutional figure as Derrida was, that Derrida, the, some of the most um, tonic part of Derrida's work on behalf of the university was his grounding himself in the university um, as, as the, the, the place of his thinking, writing, being with others. Um, Foucault was in that context as well, but was also with many other institutions that Derrida wasn't. Um, I'm thinking here about um, archives and prisons um, and um, um, things that are, of course, informed by university thought but are extra university institutions. Um, anyway, I would love to hear your, your further thoughts about that. Peter graciously declines okay. for the moment, but he will return. So we can open this now, and I see all kinds of people jumping up. How am I going to do this? Um, we start with Sarah. Yes, and then Judy, are you happy with that, or you want to go first, Judy? Sarah was just a fraction of um, before you. And the people that were standing up, were you asking to speak, or were you just stretching your limbs? I saw Gisela standing up, then she sat down again. Gisela, did you want to speak? No. Okay, then we start up here with Sarah, Judy, and then I'll come to the back. Is something happening with the mic? Thanks. Is it on? Yeah. Um, thanks to both the speakers. You both deployed the notion of the incalculable to think about the position of the humanities and in some senses to make that the platform via which you defend the humanities. So we are the incalculable against the metrics of the system against which we argue. And I think that that's important, but I think that there are other ways of doing this work of trying to defend the humanities. And it seems to me in some respects we should be more calculating about doing that work. Um, and I think that, I, you know, I want to say, given that we confront the ineffectuality of the left in some respects, combined with the now ineffectual manner of reading Derrida in the present as the sort of master of discourse analysis, is not getting us as far as we need to go. And I'm just putting that pejoratively to ask you about that. And I wonder what other strategies we could begin to deploy to defend the humanities. And at least some of the people that I'm reading are starting to talk about sort of critical abduction, which is really intervening in algorithmic thought or in, in, in digital programming for, for the ends of social justice, to turning itself against the people we wish to refute. Um, because just as we sit here talking about the humanities, kind of post-human algorithmic thinking is doing its thing in which the human or the kinds of arguments we want to make are just regarded more and more as noise and producing knowledge in relation to us. And so what do you think, and I'm asking this deliberately provocatively, about a sort of emancipatory politics of abstraction where those of us who wish to defend the humanities intervene um, in the language of abstraction that is being thrown at us? What are, what are the other kinds of strategies we can begin to articulate, Andrew, to you in particular? Um, outside of simply, uh, you know, outside of thinking about the im and the impossible um, or doing a kind of close textual reading of what it is that is before us, um, outside of hoping for randomness and chance. Are there other ways of intervening strategically uh, in a progressive way to try to defend the humanities against, against the very real forces that I think are working against it in a highly abstract way? Those are the kinds of questions I want to ask 
Um, is there a form of accelerationist politics of speeding up against speed to try to articulate the kinds of things we're interested in? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have to take my glasses off to speak. Um, well, first of all, thank you for uh, an enormously provocative uh, panel. Um, and, you know, I think we're all a little um, caught off guard by the Jasper's formulation um, that, the, that the university could be thought of as um, a self-managing a self corporation of some kind. And, um, and of course, corporation has a long history, and it, it has a, a strong economic sense, but it also involves the question of, of becoming a body with others. <laughs> Um, and there is an incorporation um, in, in incorporation. Um, so so that's, that's, that's a question, but, but, but that Jasper's formulation, read now, immediately opens up the question of management and management techniques, and, um, and how is the university being managed and by whom? Um, and what are the, the metrics of management to which um, fields, disciplines, scholars, students, staff are all now being subjected. So self-management, I think, survives in notions of um, self-governance, which Andy mentioned, um, and also academic freedom, right? Faculty have the right to govern themselves, to decide their curriculum free of um, influence by state religion, or in fact, economic interests. The last part of academic freedom, well, many parts have been destroyed in many parts of the world, or never existed in a substantial sense. But um, the way in which management techniques and management protocols, which are pervasively neoliberal, now enter into self-management, or constrain self-management, and there are two different ways of thinking about that. Either they become the language that we impose upon ourselves and the metric becomes part of self-governing or it's a metric that is imposed and limits the possibility of self-governance on the basis of our professional disciplinary or intellectual competence, which was, of course, the original uh, rationale for faculty self-governance. And, and that, that strikes me as... Um, the, the problem, it's why we can have a, an autonomous university like Buenos Aires that's permeated by neoliberal metrics. It's why we can also still talk about self-governance in certain ways um, without recognizing that we've become self-managing according to management protocols, protocols that are not subject to critical inquiry or contestation uh, because we understand our survival to be at stake there. Now, the question I have for Andy, who is, I think, has subtly alerted us to the possibility of metrics, that we shouldn't be just worried about metrics, and of course, you're right, you know, there's, there's, there's harmony, there's music, there's, there are all kinds of metrics that we need and want. We're always counting minorities, we're always um, uh, worried about demographics, we, we need statistical analyses of various kinds to make social justice claims of a very strong kind. So, you know, I agree with you, it's not metrics per se, but the one part of your talk where you became explicitly normative was when you said um, that it was your view that neoliberalism destroys thought or that it threatens to destroy thought. And whereas for metrics, you were, you were willing to say, look, there's chance, there's incalculability, it could go a number of ways, let's not assume that it's a controlling, totalizing instrument. I wondered um, whether you say the exact same for neoliberalism, given that you yourself were willing, at least provisionally, to, to tie the digital humanities to neoliberalism. Because if we were to take your more idealistic view of the incalculable that you import into the digital humanities, do you also import that into neoliberalism? 
Should we just say, hey, neoliberalism, it's got resilience, it's got possibility, it's got, it, there are new ways of, of living and knowing within neoliberalism, we shouldn't treat it as a totalizing phenomenon, it contains the incalculable as well. And I, I don't know if you're willing to go that far, but if you do, then the one normative claim you were willing to make is defeated. The one normative claim that I heard you willing to make is defeated by the, by the, by the argument. Um, the at least that's the way I heard it. There is um, one word we're not getting, it's the feedback, did you say? It's defeated, the one normative defeated. claim that he was willing to make, namely that neoliberalism destroys thought, is defeated if the same argument he applies to the digital humanities applies to neoliberalism, namely, hey, there's incalculability, there's other things that might happen. And so, so that's, that's a provocative way of asking that question. I also think, and I'm sorry I'm talking too long, that one of the points that Athena was making was that we cannot defend the humanities. We should not be in a defensive relationship, in relationship to a humanities that has consistently and systematically produced marginalization and violence, right, through, according to you at least, its forms of humanism. And that, of course, um, then opens the question um, of what you do with the fact that sometimes the form that that marginalization and violence takes is dehumanization. And do you have a strong argument against dehumanization if it's the human um, that is the, at, the, at, the, at the core of the humanities that you do not want to defend? I feel like we're at an impasse because I see you as saying, on the one hand, we need to oppose the neoliberal um, assault on the humanities, right? Because it cannot justify itself in terms of profit and impact and the rest. On the other hand, we don't want to defend a humanities that has consistently produced a, a set of exclusions that are unacceptable. So it, it seems to me that there's a, an impasse there and I'm wondering whether it's the human that's really the, the problem. Sorry for the length. Do we, con do we continue? Does somebody at the back had a hand up. So we just take these three and then play it back to here. Yeah. Could you just say your name so that we know who we are talking to? Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Laura. Thank you. Um, I wrote down the question because I'm not very good at speaking. Uh, improvised. Just could, be, could you speak louder? Okay. S speak into the mic so that we can hear you. Yeah. Is that okay? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so, first of all, many thanks for all the presentations. I found them all very interesting um, and inspiring. Um, clearly, I think the universities today face a really important challenge um, in, um, in rejecting many of the developments that are, like you said, privatization, dispossession of knowledge, and um, the very basic right of free education, in a sense. Um, at the same time, <clears throat> I think that um, the critical role of the university, especially for students, um, should be focused not just in recognizing the problems, sorry, I'm a bit nervous, <laughs> um, but also in addressing the problems in a way that makes social classes very distinctively responsible or um, subjected to these changes. So I think in a way it's important to stress when we do a critical um, attack to all these developments to try and work on a methodology um, that this critical approach can have. So to have some kind of framing which takes some variables, some things out of the analysis of all these problems in order to be able to tackle them. For example, um, I don't think it's enough to propose that our position as students is exploited or oppressed, but at the same time we have to compare our condition to the condition of other students in other parts of the world, in other universities, and be able to build a process of historicization of the developments. Um, in this sense, it, 
it would oblige the critical account to really look at how complex the history is and of how specific social agents and not just systemic processes have brought us to the position of today. Um, perhaps we can start by also focusing on how within the university we don't just have to question our identity as um, students or academics but also um, how for example I dare to say now vice chancellors or other agents that are in charge of the university can play a role in shaping for example the emergence of um, evaluation metrics that in some cases like in the UK determine the funding of the universities and so really materially um, define the possibilities that the universities have in uh, also um, building a form of opposition. Mm, in some cases there, is, uh, there are very limited chances to fund the social humanities compared to more applied sciences and there is a proper discrimination against for example disciplines such as history, philosophy, um, uh, sociology. How do we take this into account? This is also important to understand that there is a clear bias not just of neoliberal governance processes globally but in each specific case that is very peculiar in its own history. So my question in a sense would be um, how do you think we can make sure that the critical task of the university should be that of building this historical methodology as well in, within its critique so that when we critique developments we can pinpoint how they historically became in this way and we can have perhaps a more really uh, as one of the, the first question uh, pointed a much more um, targeted critique towards this is not to say that these accounts were not um, targeted at looking at how these developments are reshaping the meaning of the university but I would like to know how you think we can build a much more material um, materialistic perhaps critique of what is going on, uh, of all, especially in managerial uh, yeah, techniques. Sorry. Thank you Thank very you. much. I'm, I'm stopping this round here to play back to the panel. I would like Peter also to feel uh, involved. Get Sorry. Um, okay, I'll try to be short. Um, I very much appreciate the first questions, Sarah, Sarah's question on the incalculable and the question of how we might become, uh, in a way, more calculating in our um, critical engagement. Um, I think that. It, it would be misleading to, um, to say here that all calculation is, is bad, uh, that we shouldn't calculate. Um, I think this is really mistaken. Uh, I think that the target of our critique here is a very specific modality of calculation. Uh, it's the calculation of instrumental and entrepreneurial worth or value. It has to do with how efficiency has become uh, the standard by which everything is assessed. Um, it has to do with corporate calculation. Uh, and one thing about corporate calculation to respond to what uh, Andre was saying before is that it doesn't it does not work by working. That, that's, that's, the, that's really what complicates mat matters here. That it, of course it doesn't work. But the thing is that that's not the idea. It doesn't work by uh, working. It does, it does work, I think, by not reaching its destination in a way. Uh, it, it, it works by producing truth effects. 
Um, um, so, um, and I think this is what Derrida misses, actually. It, he misses this point uh, by being caught within this question of either you know, reaching the, the, the letter, reaching its destination or not. I think it's, it's, uh, it misses the point. But um, back to, to the, the incalculable, um, I think that, for, I mean, at least for me, what I, what I call aporia or performative aporia is always subject to the responsiveness and responsibility of decision and calculation. I think that we must calculate after all. I cannot imagine any way of resistance or critique or dissidence without having to deal with the question of calculating as a strategy uh, of critique. Um, so I'm, I'm totally um, in favor of, of that. I, I think it's, it's important to retain that, uh, that this, this um, questioning of um, calculation tar targets a specific uh, politically situated and historically situated uh, um, uh, formulation of, of um, calculation. Of course, we have to calculate all the time. How, we have to calculate how we best deal with uh, the um, domination of corporate calculation, corporate metrics, and um, uh, all that. Um, now, the, um, I'm a little disoriented here. Maybe, ah, oh, okay. Judith's question on uh, management, self-management, and more specifically, actually, the question which, which was um, uh, directed to me had to do with dehumanization and uh, humanism. Um, I think that um, the challenge here is to defend what is not defendable as such. But this does not um, reduce, for me, the necessity, the sheer urgency and necessity to defend. What is not defendable as such in the sense that it's not a homogeneous single apparatus that we're there to defend. I mean, um, I have in mind all kinds of epistemic hostility, which is targeted against new and radical critical epistemologies within the humanities. Um, um, uh, and when I, when I talk about humanism, I have to clarify that once again, I mean you know, theoretical I mean, my, my standpoint is a standpoint of theoretical anti-humanism, um, uh, which for me is a site, a, a way, a gesture through which we criticize the forces of dehumanization. Because I think dehumanization belongs in the same apparatus as humanism. If we take humanism as I do, as um, a way to talk about Eurocentric uh, humanism, possessive and self-possessive um, individualism, classicism, which I mean, for, uh, at least for my the country where I grew up is very important. Um, the classicist canon, the nationalist canon too, um, and of course, uh, middle class values, professionalization, all that. So when I talk about Humanism, I, I mean precisely that, and that my standpoint is uh, that we have to defend what is critical about the humanities and not, not assume a defensive, um, I would say, it's a problematic term, but I use it anyway, a, a backward-looking uh, gesture of critique, uh, because I think neoliberalism is turning us all into uh, conservatively thinking critical subjects. We're all um, uh, caught into this urgency to defend what we have or what we, what we think we used to have or we think, but who is we? I mean, who, who, who used to own something that we feel uh, obliged to, to defend? That's, I mean, my question is precisely that. That's why I, I deliberately 
um, said, mentioned that we have to take the standpoint of the inappropriate others, and the humanities had their own inappropriate others. And we have, we have been uh, dealing with enormous amounts of, of hostility, epistemic hostility, uh, which comes, most of it comes from practitioners of humanities. Uh, so I think that this is something that we have to deal with and w while, while trying to build alliances uh, within the humanities, of course. Um, so, yeah, I mean, dehumanization is, of course, uh, a, a way in which uh, sovereign humanism works. Um, so that's why, uh, for me, the question is how to um, raise the question of the, of the human whose humanity persists despite or, despite or, or against these forces of dehumanization. Um, I think that's about it for now. Thank you. I think Sarah Natto would say this is critical abduction. Um, in this, this is the answer to your question. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, I went back to see what I actually said in that sentence, was I didn't remember. Um, it was, I take neoliberalism to be a threat to thinking like no other in the history of the university. I would also argue against the assumption that there can be no accident in the world of metrics. Um, the threat that's unprecedented is the way in which entrepreneurial strategies have descended. And I wondered, because most administrators aren't smart to have decided to do this by themselves, where this came from and how it um, achieved the kind of, of near global coverage within a very short time that this is how universities need to be governed as a business. Um, and that, that, is, that is an axiom you hear everywhere, um, or at least I've heard everywhere. Um, and that is, of course, something that one needs to push back on. Um, maybe even say, what kind of business? Um, the, the notion of the business that the university is supposed to be um, is um, almost never stated in these, in these discussions. Um, I, I also don't think that one needs to be anti-business to defend the business of the university, say. Um, I do believe that the, the neoliberal crisis is an opportunity um, and precisely because as the borders between the university and its outside um, have become harder and harder to locate, um, this, is, this is the opportunity that people excluded from the university um, by gender, race, class, distance, um, now have an opportunity um, to produce kinds of knowledge that are also communal. Um, that's, that the DH is a communal, you know, th there is no sound emitted by one blog clapping. Um, it is um, uh, uh, instant readership, instant response. Um, but it, e even if some of the technique, the technology ultimately comes through a university, um, these are um, exportable and um, you, they can be pirated, and, and they have. I um, have a whole other collection of, of, of sites to show, which I'll wait for another time, where some of that pirating happens. Um, is that pirating a liberation strategy? I don't know. Um, um, my question would be, what happens to liberation as a strategy, as a concept, in a, in a, in a, a, a now virtual world. And I, you know, that's the, that's the aporetic instance here. As a chair, I um, have to say something, because I'm very worried about where we're going with this. Um, of course, this is the, the Deleuzean materialist angle coming in. But Andy, just to take what you just said, I would contest empirically the statement you just made that technologies go through the universities. The whole point about the existence of the digital humanities is that knowledge is being produced brilliantly 
rigorously outside anything that has anything to do with the university. It is the cognitive infrastructures of advanced capitalism that is producing the knowledge. And let's open the chapter, environmental humanities, if you want the other big boy in the block. And, and let's open the other chapter, medical humanities. The tragedy of the universities and the reason why we're under attack is that we've lost research. And, to the cognitive character of contemporary capitalism. So it's not just the humanities that are under attack. In Utrecht, we shut down astronomy. Who needs astronomy? Um, we're shutting down serious sciences that are not technologically applicable. I think, I think there is a serious conversation to be had here about what we mean by capitalism and what it is that we're fighting against when we're fighting against something that we call neoliberalism because it is so cognitive, it is so brilliant, it has so many fantastic right-wing philosophers working for them that I think that the real issue here is what model of intellectuality are we holding up as we hold up as we should the mission of a critical function for the university? What model of the intellectual? And Christine Lagarde is a hell of a thinker. And she, does, she has a team of people working at Davos whose main target is defeating poverty, reaching equality, social justice, because they're scared of revolutions, but these are formidable thinkers. The man in charge of the Front National, Florian Filippo, major gay activist, the leading figure of LBGT, superb, totally right wing. Um, we need to look at the models of critical intellectuality, and I think there is a profound disagreement here between a materialist, somebody said, Deleuzean reading of advanced capitalism and this much more, apart from the aporetic that I have respect for, seems to me much more Hegelian traditional readings of what kind of logistics we're in. Uh, the post-humanities are the new humanities. They're, they've taken over. The old humanities faculties, even in this university, are minor. We are not even sitting in the humanities faculty. Logistically, we are in the Global Academy program. And, and I think if you look at any universities across Europe, you will find the old humanities, and next to them, new constructions, um, new mega constructions that would inevitably contain the digital, the environmental, and all the media stuff. Um, so I think we need to interrogate critically our own, I think, um, understanding of do we feel dispossessed by the cognitive character of advanced capitalism? Maybe that's as, as, as clear as I can put it. <laughs> to, to read this Jasper's book in the context because for us this book is useful because he's using critique, he's combining critique and university but this book is, is uh, he wrote this book after 13 years uh, of destruction of university. And he reminded us that university, in, in essence of the university, is uh, corporate, corporativism, we can say, but not the state. Uh, for example, here in Italy, after Berlusconi, uh, universities changed. And uh, in the United States, university will also be different after the Trump. In that case, the uh, idea is to, okay, to read in context, but to try to, to understand that uh, every group uh, needs uh, some kind of the name or some kind of the transformation in the plural subject, plural in we. And uh, you have, in that case, immediately you have some kind of incorporation or Corporation. First group in, in Babylon Tower, they are together, they are doing something, and they need the name. They are innovative, they are learning between them, and they need a name, and they want to incorporate their work. In that case, this is always problematic how we can arrange this, this 
relation, university corporation or university institution, etc. I'm just still haunted by Rose's um, very uh, perceptive point, and I totally agree. I mean, the question of how um, we can think of our, our models of intellectuality um, and uh, try to deal with the, the kinds of logistics in which we, we find ourselves today. I think, I totally agree with that, and I think that it's, it would be important to try to pose these questions uh, from a perspective of an embodied and embedded, as you uh, say, perspective of critical situatedness. Um, I have in mind, if you, if you allow me, two uh, examples. One comes from Turkey and the, um, the, uh, the lynching campaign against the signatories of the Academics for Peace uh, petition. Um, and as you may know, there was recently uh, a call coming from the Academics for Peace uh, group, uh, a call on all institutions of higher education, funding councils, um, academic and professional associations, and individual faculty to boycott the Turkish higher education system. And I, when I received this, this call, I was inclined, of course, uh, to, 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 to sign it, but I wanted to make sure, double check with my uh, friends uh, still based in Turkey. Um, and I, I, found it, I found very uh, interesting what, what the, 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 the answer that I got was that uh, this is a targeted boycott um, and the hope is that this boycott will not affect students or individual academics, but will mainly hit institutions. Um, and for me, this is a very important um, uh, challenge here, which puts us all, all the time, again and again, in front of the question of which institutions, which humanities, uh, which university, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, the hope was that this targeted call uh, would not hit, um, 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 you know, uh, faculty and, and uh, Erasmus students, but mainly uh, it would um, hit the most despisable institutions, namely the institutions which are in, com in complicity with um, the regime. Uh, this is the first one. The, the, the other one is uh, an image which pressed itself on me as I was uh, preparing for, for this uh, conference. Uh, the image is this. Um, imagine um, an elementary school in Athens whose gates are locked and chained by concerned citizens, uh, basically far-right supporters and Golden Dawn uh, politicians, uh, who wanted to protest against the governmental plan to place refugee children in the, 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 the secondary education system. So a whole movement emerged from that, which was asking for the opening of the schools. I mean, this opening of schools here uh, is very, I think, very um, interesting to think with and to think about. Um, uh, so these people took, had to take off the chains um, and, and admit refugee children in, in the schools. So again, which institutions, which schools are we defending? How do we position our, ourselves within this battlefield? Because I think it is, after all, a battlefield, and the battle goes on. Thank you. Looking around the room, anybody? Andy, are you coming in? No. No? I, I couldn't hear. <laughs> you can, you, if you wanted to speak. Anybody else? Any comments, reaction? I'm looking at Sandro. Is he still here? People spoke yesterday, linking in with this. Yes? Hello? Um, I've not got a definitive answer, obviously, for how to, like no one does, but I am 
one of the things that I would always suggest is that Can you speak closer to the mic? Yes. I haven't got a definitive answer for how to, but one of the things I would always suggest and the thing that I'm always interested in is basically looking at the people who seem to be suffering the most due to precarity, due to neoliberal calculations that happen within universities. Even closer, there we go. So, for instance, the SOAS strikers uh, in London, the cleaners that were striking, and the way in which the students actually galvanized and helped with that campaign, because those cleaners were obviously not on contracts, um, they were all working very precariously for a contractor that was quite happy not to pay them pensions, sick leave, holiday. And without um, the support of the students, the campaign I don't think couldn't have been as, as successful as it was. Um, there was a calculation going on there. There was a measurement going on there on behalf of the contractors, on behalf of university management, to decide whether or not they were of value or not. Um, another example that I'd also give is uh, students refusing to fill out, in, in, in the UK, in UK universities, we have essentially a form which is to, to deal with, uh, whereby universities are, are assessed in terms of their kind of excellence of kind of teaching. And a form goes out each year. And this form has to be completed, has to be completed by every student. And then this is compiled and made into a table which is then published in like broadsheet newspapers and parents look at this and decide where they might send their children to university. Now the NUS last year was, I can't remember if they actually did or not, but they were very close to putting in a blanket ban so the National Union of Students were putting in a blanket ban on, we're basically boycotting this form. And that's not perhaps radical, but I'd say it's a really quite effective way of refusing this level of calculation, this level of um, kind of neoliberal sort of measurement. Um, because one thing the students, and I was teaching last year, and one thing that the, my students definitely were not interested in was filling in a form to give the university more information about how excellent they were as a university. What they were interested in was like grounded teaching. They're interested in contact hours. They're interested in departments not closing down or equipment being available. Um, and sorry to say this, but also to finish off, I saw far more kind of radical, um, deep thinking coming from either contracted cleaners or precarious students in their early 20s than I did see from own departments, which seemed to be far more towing the line along working with the unions and things like this. And, if we just do it slow and steady, we'll be all right, and things like this. And it seemed to be a far more kind of insular crisis that was going on that wasn't linking up with this problem, you know, as an epidemic, as a structural problem. Um, so do I take your question to be, given the scale, size, intensity of student activism, you're asking this as a question, you're putting it as a question, or is it a remark? I, I, am, I am putting it as a question, because I don't know, I, I, I kind of felt that there's always this reluctance to sort of refer to the kind of material conditions and the actual material things that we can actually see with our eyes and there's, there's a reluctance I think sometimes because there's something okay. that's... I'm going to try to modulate your question back to, to the panel. Yeah, please do. Every time we think about the critical thinker, it's the teacher, it's not the student. The idea that the, that the students can be part of the critical thinking is recent, shall we say. You have to go to feminism and, and the recent social movement, but the, talking about the image of the critical intellectual is not a student, um, uh, traditionally, not in Jasper's views, but I'm putting this provocatively as, as a question. But assembly, public assemblages of students in public spaces have been across the world um, uh, a motor of so many of the changes. In fact, a return of bodies in public spaces um, has been happening in feminism, in so many movements, and that maybe is a dialogue with the digital, um, because the same students that are assembling in the public space, I'm sure you've got your Facebook pages, you've got your Second Life, you've got your social networks, you, you are utterly, completely, distressingly mediated, and yet you also take over the public space. So I'm just, maybe there is a digital analog issue here that, that Andy can comment on, and maybe Athena on student formations um, uh, in relation to a certain idea of the critical thinker as, as a master, not a student, and whatever you want to connect, Peter, to this. We make this the last round, and then we chuff off to lunch. I, I'm, I didn't hear everything that you you mentioned because this is a I, maybe this particular chair is in a auditory dead spot. Um, but I I was in fact going to refer you to Judith's book, um, the 
assemblage has changed, um, activism has changed, um, because again of the affordances that digital technology provides. Um, the interesting question is, is you know, one could not have predicted the uses of that technology in advance, but the kinds of activism that has become possible, um, and that is the thing that one can't, couldn't calculate it in advance. Um, of course, calculation, strategic thinking is important in assemblage, but the, the shape that it takes, um, the ability to organize in ways that hadn't been possible, this is new, and um, these are opportunities. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, assemblies and the, the performativity of assembling is very important here. And uh, the whole question of the re-emergence of, of the demos, as Wendy Brown has put it. Uh, I would just add here one thing, uh, that when we think about taking action as exclusively taking to the streets, I think that we should take into consideration the people who cross the pathway, the, water, the waterways of the Mediterranean in overcrowded um, boats. This is, this is agency too. So appearance, again, who is able to appear and how and what counts as appearance is a question that we need to pose anew all the time, I think. Thank you very much. I have had enough for six months on this panel. <laughs> Splendid, accurate, grounded, passionate, amazing intervention from the floor. A wonderful morning. Please join me in thanking these wonderful people and see you all at 3.30 in this, af this afternoon. But thank you. Wonderful.